Oh no. I was in four triple is bad now. Yeah. I think uh actually I don't think any of those are four triples, but what they did is like there was like a room in the middle that was like the like hangout room. Yeah. And they actually made that into a dorm room too. Oh my god. So there wasn't even any communal space. Yeah. Didn't they do that on central during COVID when they everybody had to be like was it were they supposed to be in singles or were they I mean, they couldn't do triples, so they took some of the common rooms in Central and put beds in them. Yeah, no was, I think they might have. I'm not totally sure. So, so they were right here, like where this building. They were over here. They were right across the green, um, oh. where the like the new emergency department of the hospital is. I used to look down into the old emergency, not like into the old emergency room, but like at the emergency exit, and then they built that all out into where the shoe boxes were. I'm sure they would show up on like some old aerials, but yeah, they were terrible. It was actually like a pretty unique experience because the rooms were so small that I appreciate it because everybody's always had the doors open. So like some of those guys, you know, like were in my way, like that not there. Because it was just like it wasn't like some of the other dorms where it's very easy to be closed up. So I appreciated that. While small, it was much more communal. Oh. Yeah, I was in a forest triple my freshman year in Davis and Headstone. I remember oh, okay. being miserable. I got like the short end of the stick where I had like the top bunk bed and I had to share a closet and my desk was really far <laughs> I, away. I think about it now and I'm like, I live, you know, in a house. I'm like, how did I ever? But like, I missed my first football. I, I, very, I was a very different person. Uh, very different that. person 14 years ago. We have to share one closet because we had to put one of our like dressers like in the closet you didn't have any space we didn't think of that we had all of the dressers just out and we debunked oh, yeah. we used maddie and fiona's extra they, they she, got was fiona? she was no she was next oh, door yeah, so it was maddie oh. and Kate am i like and Joanna in today. frame I and Where's the camera? Oh, the camera's like literally, literally right the laptop. There, yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah. if I'm here, this yeah. this will work. Yeah. Yeah. And then do we want to do a quick check? check? Can you see it on here? In Teams. Yeah. Can you just open the Teams and see if we can see him? Oh, sure. sorry. I just screwed that up. No, you're good. Don't worry. Oh, you're already recording. Yes. I hope I did not. We'll cut the recording. Don't worry. Okay. Oh, that's that's wow. that's something. That's, that's not weird. Work. Well, it should hopefully record the content. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. And wow, that's I am like really cool. I am no, in. That's cool. Let's just do it like that. We could share the screen on it so you can just see the presentation and maybe hear the voice. Yeah, that's probably what. We're doing. Right. I think that's what you'd want to do. Oh well, it says we are sharing. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so that was in. <laughs> what, what were we launching the presentation from? I just had it in preview. In preview, okay. Let's see if I know the icon for preview. It's right next to the E ed to the left of it. Oh, the R or the? No, the one next to the. Oh, yeah, yeah, that, I would... that one. Yeah, there we go. And then did you do full screen somehow? I'm um, sorry, I don't have the Wi Fi right now because I guess it's just literally. <laughs> Mine can't open. So but I guess we know that we can see them anyway. Okay. Amanda, are you excited to come back? Yes, I am. I do not want to be doing schoolwork. <laughs> yeah, cool. Relatable. Yeah. Relatable. But, yeah, how are all the projects Hi, going? What's so, up, guys? Great. Yeah. Angus, this is Drew. We're busy. This nice is Angus, our social media Angus, chair. pleasure. Yeah, so tell me about, so you guys have started a student chapter of IDE? Yes. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. A lot of schools like have them. Yeah. Very common, but yeah, it doesn't have one yet. And I think it's probably because the transportation department is so small. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I still think, how did I end up in transportation based on my course load at UVM? And there was literally one class, and that changed everything. <laughs> Two classes, I should say. When did you graduate? 2011. Okay. Yeah, I was just saying I walked through Vody for the first time in 11 years. <laughs> and the joke was that there is, uh, I think, the thickest walls on the entire campus are the Bodie building, because if there is one group of people that would know how to blow it up if they got tired of going to it, it would be engineers. <laughs> and so it is literally bomb proof. Uh, I didn't change in the 11 years. Here? Yeah. Well, yeah, mass. In Vody? No, it looked the exact same. I like walked, I walked past the one classroom. I was like, oh my God, I had statics in there. I never, <laughs> I never want to pull down one of those chairs again. I was like, I don't ever want to, oh man. Okay, yeah, I can see it. 
You can. But yeah, yeah. Cal uh, Calkin's oh. still here. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, it is going. So Amanda, have you been singing our praises, uh, our BHB praises? Oh yeah. <laughs> yep. Our um, treasurer actually just got an internship over the summer. Her name's Maya Sage. Oh. And with, sure. uh, do you know with what group? No, it was just like transportation planning engineer intern for the summer. With with BHB. Right. Yeah, with BHB. Yeah. Oh, then she must have just found that out like this week. Yeah, she found yeah, out she like did. last Friday. Okay. Because I was on our intern committee last. That's last cool. year when we found this this we gem were... in the red hoodie. Amanda. Yeah. There's only two intern spots, right? Or are there more? Oh, we might be hiring more. Oh, really? We have so much work. <laughs> yeah. Maybe if you need part time. Yeah. How's we the had. Office? Is it half and half right now? Like. It is. Well, our our hybrid policy officially starts on Monday. Okay. But like uh, most people, especially people who are in like shared living situations, so yeah. like don't have room for a desk or an office at home, yeah. are coming in okay. regularly. Yeah, I'm excited to go into the office this year. Yeah, you will be. You will be. You'll be able to. Yeah. yeah. And there, uh, there's yeah, we're, all the restrictions are are down. Yeah. Which I will uh, once we're all settled, I'll take off my mask because I don't like having a sweaty face. But mm -hmm. I have a newborn at home, so I'm being a little, little cautious. Oh, sweet. Oh God. <laughs> Are you attending this? I had to. Oh my god. How are you? Oh, good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Good. Oh boy. Now somebody that knows me is here. <laughs> I just talked you up to two of my uh, members of my cohort, so they might come in a little late. Cool. God, now I hope I deliver. <laughs> <laughs> well, Erica, you'll be familiar with one of the, the projects I'm diving deep on. Which one? North Champlain Street. Oh, I yeah. am familiar with yes. that one. Eric and I used to work on this project together. Yes, we worked together for 2018. How long is it? Two years? Three it was years? a little bit. Yeah. It was a wee bit. Yeah. Not too long. All right, I'll be back with all the pressing questions. <laughs> Good. Yeah, so Erica worked at VHB until she started her master's program. Do you guys know her? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Well, that's Erica. <laughs> yeah, she was with us for a few years. And then right when the pandemic kind of started, she was on her, she was, I think that was when she started her program with, um, I can't remember his name now. Greg. 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 <laughs> Is it, are we going to wait for him? Should we wait for any others? Yeah, I think we got like two more minutes. Okay. Um, a couple more minutes. We'll give him a second. Yeah, he's definitely going to. I can be, yeah, we he can was, start. Yeah, he was just here. He's like, just going to go. Come right back. Oh, cool. So, Let's wait for them. Yeah. I mean, I'll keep this very informal and very, <laughs> very, very conversational to you. So that's cool. We are college kids, so <laughs> that's how it goes. I love there's only so much formality that's possible. To be fair, she didn't want to come. No, she doesn't like transportation. It's not for everyone. I'm just here because I didn't want to be in P camp today. What are you talking about? We wanted to see Drew's presentation. Yeah, I am. I am honored. <laughs> well, I mean, I I just like wasn't gonna do anything today. Then I had to go drop off my uh, midterm person, hard copy, handwritten, like 15 pages of integrals. I just yeah. could sit there for more of it. <laughs> I'll spoil something for you. You don't you don't use those. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted to do chemical stuff, so I might have to. When was the last time you worked at a college? 2011. Okay, yeah, good. This makes me feel a lot <laughs> Doesn't mean people in my profession don't. They they certainly do, but yeah, no. God, what was that? Differential equations for engineering? Is that still a yeah, course? Yeah. Yeah. Or engineering mathematics? Advanced yeah, it's like 271. Wow, I was about to say exactly that number. <laughs> Who's the professor? Jen Young. Yeah. I had it online. Yeah. 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 So it was I, I lost it last year. It was like, I, I, I had lunch 
tell you how to solve it. Like who has a question? If somebody answered it, answered it, you would go like, "Yay!" Yeah, I wanted to go with kids you, but I'm like, you don't even know. Yeah, that was my. That was I think the hardest class I ever took in college. Was, yeah. was we love it. Yeah, that was like my favorite. I love that class. Oh man, we had a tough professor. Was, was Victor my Rossi here for drafting when you were here? Rossi was my freshman year. Yeah. <laughs> Rossi here. was my dad's college roommate. <laughs> oh my god. Actually. Yeah. Uh, that yeah. took me a second. But... Oh yeah, like my father's <laughs> college roommate was Victor Rossi. <laughs> yeah. That's a story. Oh yeah. yeah. My dad works at what's that? What was it here? Uh, uh tech, Vermont Tech. Okay. Yeah. And then what was um, like in college. I'd have to ask my dad. <laughs> Probably not much different than he is now. <laughs> but uh yeah, my, my father's worked here at the university for 35 years. So what does he teach? Uh he's actually in uh IT. Okay. So he's in the Waterman building. Cool. Yep. This is Dr. Rongold, our advisor. Nice to meet you, Dr. Rongold. <laughs> What? Do I, like I understand. I my shine wears off quickly. <laughs> That's why it's, I'm only keeping this to 20 minutes and I'm out. <laughs> All right. We can crop recordings, right? We can. Do it. Oh yeah, you can. We'll crop. We'll crop the first part of the recording. Oh yeah. We but can. we've all become acquainted with Drew. Oh yes. Lock people out. Oh yes. That's one way to stop the door. <laughs> Okay, so we've all kind of become acquainted with Drew, but yeah. Drew is from BHB. He's going to be giving us a presentation on bike infrastructure in Vermont. Um, he's a 2011 graduate, yeah. and I guess I will let you keep introducing yourself. Yeah, I'll take it from there. I'm going to take my mask off. Uh, yeah, so as Evelyn just said, I'm Drew Jingers. I work for BHB. We're located in South Burlington, just down the road here. Uh, Erica, former former BHB, -er, and then she left us to join her program. Maybe one day we'll Tricker coming back. Yeah, we'll see, um, yeah. So uh, as as Evelyn kind of introduced, you know, it was sounded like loose parameters for a presentation. We wanted to talk about transportation projects in the state of Vermont. The thing is, we do so many of those that it would have been a very overwhelming experience, and I would have spoken the whole time. So I thought I'd narrow it down to the work we do in Burlington and kind of open it up for a discussion about some of the projects I'll speak to here, as well as just any general work, any questions you have about our work or the work I do, um, or what else we're doing. So. Here's a beautiful Main Street. I'm going to start off a little bit about myself. Uh, I graduated here, as I've just shared, in 2011. I moved to Washington, D.C. in 2015. I lived there for four years. Uh, biggest news, I'm a dad now. Uh, <laughs> I'm just, just finding this out. Uh, that is my daughter. She is 12 weeks old today. Her name is Jane Kaylin Jingris. She is even cuter than that now. Um, and I am an avid golfer, skier, and hiker. A little bit of Vermont cliche in that sense, but... I've, I've lived here my whole life with the exception of my four years in DC, and I quickly realized it was where I wanted to spend all of my life. So I'm back now, and a brief uh, introduction about me professionally. I've been working for VHB in October. It'll be 10 years. Uh, I still can't believe that. I worked in our Vermont office for over five years now. I spent four years in our Washington, DC office as well. When I first started up here, I was primarily doing multimodal transportation design, which was a smaller practice for us than it is now. Uh, when I moved to Washington, D.C., I got a lot more into urban bikeway design, um, designing. I actually was embedded with the DOT. I was their on-site engineer in their planning and sustainability division. And so I was the designer for, I have probably worked on over 100 uh, on-street bike facility projects in Washington, D.C., and probably upwards of 30 miles of bike lanes, separated bike lanes, bike boulevards, projects of that nature. Um, and so now all... Uh, now I do all things uh, multimodal planning and design. And a little bit about VHB, as I touched on, I obviously worked between here and Washington, D.C. We are an ever-growing firm. We have now 30-plus offices, which is kind of crazy to me. Up and down the East Coast, there's a little blip of all of our offices in Vermont. We're, we're here, and we're in, uh, we're in South Burlington, being here, and Montpelier. And then we're headquartered in Watertown, Mass. And we do a little bit of everything. I can't remember what slide comes next. Okay. Uh, what do we do here? Uh, short answer is a lot. Um, these are just this is just a smattering of projects uh, that we've been working on over the last one to two years. Um, I've whoops, I've kind of highlighted uh, what I'll be speaking to a little bit more in depth today. These four projects in bold, 
but we have a transportation planning design and engineering group. We have a traffic group. We have land development and site civil design. We also have an entire suite of environmental scientists and engineers. We also uh, added site investigation and remediation to our services a, a little bit ago. We uh, acquired the Johnson Company in Montpelier and they now work as VHBers. They do a lot of investigation into uh, dirty dirt is the simple term, but uh, contaminated soils, which are ever present in our lovely little city here, given how the waterfront and surrounding areas were previously used. Um, but yeah, that's just a, a, a brief look at what we do uh, in Burlington. As you can imagine, the list, if I would have gone statewide, would have probably been about six of these pages because we do so much work across the street, uh, across the state, excuse me. Focusing on today, I'm gonna do a pretty high level look at uh, some of the projects I've, I've managed and worked on. Uh, the colors are kind of go schematically with a little graphic here. I'm going to talk about a quick build conversion project. Did you work on that with me? Un poquito, a little I bit? The parking on Pearl Street. Oh, yeah, the Pearl Street design, yeah. And the traffic <clears throat> Yes, Pearl and Battery, right, right. Um, so I'm going to talk about a the quick build conversion project, and again, I'll get into the detail. Uh, Birchcliff Parkway, which is down in the lower half of the screen, south end of Burlington, a safe routes to school and traffic calming design effort. Uh, an ongoing East Avenue, Bright Street, and Scarf Avenue traffic calming project. So uh, you can see that is just just east of us with East Avenue. And actually, I should say, on the previous slide, I think uh, my director Jen Conley and Jason Charest of the RPC came and spoke about the Colchester Avenue complete street scoping study. I think I see you nodding your head a little bit ago. Another very very prominent project for UVM. That was a that was a very cool study where we looked at just kind of making Colchester Avenue a complete street uh, from the intersection with uh, South slash North Prospect all the way down to Barrett Street uh, just before the bridge in Winooski. Um, that was a great project. And then, yeah, I, just to stay on this slide a second longer, our biggest effort right now is our Main Street project. And I figured uh, if I do okay today, I'll come back in a few months when that project is a little bit further along and speak to that. But the Great Streets initiative uh, that Burlington has in place, I'm I don't know if you guys are familiar with St. Paul Street downtown and City Hall Park for those recent complete reconstructions of that street and that park were through this Great Streets initiative. We're now doing the same thing with Main Street from Battery to Union Street. Um, so that's going to be a very, very significant project and it's ongoing right now. Predominantly public outreach to date. Come the fall, we'll be getting a bit more into the engineering design. So if you want to hear about that come the fall, be happy to come back and tell you about that. But getting back to this list, um, traffic calming projects along East Ave, Bright Street, and Scarf Ave in the South End. And then I'm going to take a deep dive on one of the projects that's near and dear to my heart, which is the North Champlain Street and Manhattan Drive bikeway facilities planning and design effort. Any questions so far? All right. Just take a quick little sip of water. Does anybody know about the Quick Build program in the city of Burlington? I'm not surprised. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen the upper right corner though, that sort of uh, implementation in a couple different locations throughout the city. There's a couple uh, applications of that along Main Street and the quick build uh, program started in 2018 and the city of Burlington published a guide basically saying, okay, we get, we get um, calls all the time. This intersection's unsafe. I don't feel safe as a pedestrian crossing this street. How can we address that? They worked with a couple of other uh, consultants to develop their quick build guide and that basically came up with a list of materials, of specifications, of criteria to kind of meet and install these rapid implementation uh, projects to address safety concerns. So this is Elmwood Avenue. You can see they put planters, they put ballers, they put striping to basically uh, cut off two-way travel and, and shorten that pedestrian crossing. And the intent of all of these projects over time was to see how they behave. Do they work? Do the, do the items get run over? Do they not really fit with the geometry of the street? Have we gotten good public feedback that they are actually effective, that they are making these known um, challenging locations safer? And if the answer was yes, the city then would go through and permanently implement those. And so one of our early contracts with the city was to do what was called the Quick Build Conversion Project. And you can kind of see the 2019 versus the 2021 uh, applications at Elmwood Ave and then at Pearl and George in the right on the right side there. So we basically take these take these things that are put in kind of worry free that you're not going to impact utilities, you're not going to impact drainage, you're not going to impact curb lines or anything like that with these quick build implementations, which is why they're really appealing. But then when you do get into that 
you know, a good example up here in the upper right corner is you can see a catch basin drainage inlet on that corner. Well, that was right there. So what, what do we do now? And what about how does that tie into the rest of the stormwater infrastructure? So getting into that engineering design is what is basically the service we provided to the city for this project um, and made those uh, temporary applications uh, more permanent. Birchcliff Parkway is a roadway in the south end. This was also a really great project. Uh, we worked with the city all the way from concept development through to construction engineering design. And this was driven by a Safe Routes to School study effort that was done in 2017. Um, uh, continuing west here, you'll eventually reach Pine Street. And along Pine Street, there's Champlain Elementary School. And this is a heavily residential neighborhood. Lots of children were walking to school, sometimes, you know, if a parent sometimes alone and but they were feeling unsafe there was a lot of cut through traffic there was uh if you think about where birch cliff is if you're driving up shelburne road north and you don't want to wait in the light at flynn a lot of people would turn down birch cliff parkway to get down pine street and you're cutting through a neighborhood of 70 houses we looked at traffic data to actually confirm yes there are 950 cars traveling through birch cliff parkway a day to 70 houses that didn't seem right uh, we also looked at the speeds. There was a speeding issue along the roadway because it was generally clear uh, because it is just a neighborhood roadway. So there's not uh, nothing really stopping people from going too fast. But then when you factor in the lack of pedestrian crossings, the number of children going to school became apparent that they actually did want to put in some traffic calming practices as well as pedestrian improvements. And so we worked with the city to develop some concepts, which is what you see on the lower side of the screen here, we then present those concepts to the public, get their feedback. Is this what you want? Do you want a crossing here? Do you want a crossing at the next block? And then once we have that confirmed concept, we'll then develop engineering drawings, which is just a sample you see on the right side there. So that's a drainage drawings where we bumped out two corners of the intersection with Birchcliff Parkway and Linden Terrace and then constructed or designed a raised crosswalk. This is going to get constructed hopefully next month. Uh, starting tomorrow whenever the construction season does begin as weather permits and these improvements will be in before uh, next year's school year so that'll be great this was a this was a really really fun project also a very engaged uh, community anytime you do engineering design in a neighborhood or in a heavily residential area you're going to get more input than if you were to say be doing a public meeting for a, a major arterial you know I think we had more attendees at a meeting like this than we did for some of our public hours on Colchester Avenue, for example. Um, so it's it's an, always interesting if you if you're, I mean, if you think about it, if you're going to be working outside somebody's front yard, they're going to be a lot more curious about it than if you're working, you know, on their commute to work or something like that. What's the next project? So this is a project that started uh, just in the fall, and this is under a new, uh, similar to Birch Gulf Parkway traffic coming project, but it's under the new procedure and manual um, that the city published in 2020, where they're kind of taking a different approach to traffic calming. So what they previously did is basically any call they would get from a community member about unsafe travel speeds or dangerous roadway, there's cars going, you know, two way on a one way street or cars going 40 miles an hour down my road, they would look into it. And they were getting to the point where their backlog of requests was in the hundreds. And they said, we can't keep up with this demand. And who knows how, how many of these are actually war truly warranted. So they published this guide and sought out basically data-driven applications of traffic calming. So they published this manual and it has five different criteria for meeting the needs of a traffic calming project. And so what we did is they identified three streets that all checked these boxes. For example, if the two-year crash hit history had 10 uh, type one crashes or type two crashes, which is uh, property damage that would check the box. If there was one type one crash, which is injury or fatality, that that would meet the criteria. If the crash involved a bicyclist or pedestrian or vul vul vulnerable, excuse me, roadway user, that was a criteria. Um, if speeding was in uh, X percent over the over the posted speed limit, that was another criteria. And so they basically that whittled down a lot of the requests they got into uh, streets that were identified as unsafe or where there were too high speeds relative to what was actually how the roadway should actually function. And this is another project where we're going kind of soup to nuts, concept development, public outreach and engineering design along Bright Street, um, Scarf Avenue in the South End and East Avenue. East Avenue is kind of a kind of a bear. There's a lot of traffic on East Avenue. It's also an emergency vehicle route. 
It's also uh, all residential along the east side, and so it's all residential permit parking. And anytime you're touching residential permit parking, you're in for it. Uh, you're going to have a really fun outreach process and potentially not get to implement your project. But those are all the, the fun challenges that you get into when you uh, engage with the public, but they're they're necessary. I mean, these these are people's houses. These are people's streets. They're used to them functioning one way. And we need to be sure that in what we're implementing, it still serves them as it needs to while also addressing another identified issue. Yes. So I live right where the six is. I can walk to that. Is that uh, I don't want to use that. Chase or Billino? Is that right? Uh, I live on East Ave. It's oh, right okay. to the left of that corner. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you said that it's an emergency route. I hear like three ambulances a day going by. Yeah. If you're going to add all of these elements to slow down traffic, how is that going to affect ambulances getting to the hospital? That is that is the <laughs> one of the many questions around this project because um, we had initially said well understanding the sensitivity around parking could we propose vertical deflections so similar to the birch cliff parkway can we do a series of speed tables can we do a series of speed bumps we quickly kind of you know we knew the answer to our own question understanding that ambulances do travel down the roadway and uh not so much in speed to destination or time to destination but in disruption to the rear of an ambulance and if there is a uh, patient in the back of the ambulance and what a vertical deflection will do to them uh was the challenge we also though then found out from the medical center that this is actually not the su supposed to be taken emergency route yeah. they're supposed to travel and i cannot recall the name of this roadway that loops around the hospital but from the emergency department here they're supposed to travel around here and exit here uh to get to the interstate or come in this way but some yeah. of the ambulances will come down close to your turn left and then turn left again uh to come into the emergency department but as you said, you know, the, it was funny. One of the things we heard from the medical department is this road is in such bad shape that ambulance operators choose to use East Avenue. So please keep that open for emergency access, which was them basically saying, we don't want to maintain our road and make it better for our ambulance operators. So make sure you don't do anything <laughs> that would jeopardize their travel time along East Avenue, all the while compromising the safety of the roadway 99% of the rest of the time when there are not ambulances on the roadway. It's one of the tricky balances of transportation engineering and design. You always need to or you always need to think about the worst case scenario, even if it happens once per day. You need to plan on the 62 foot long truck making this right turn, even though there's one delivery a day that does that. And that's not going to change your whole intersection geometry for the rest of the day because you need to be able to facilitate that. Uh, one of my bigger frustrations with our profession is we need to think about the half of the half of a percent uh, when it's really the 99.9 percent .9 that is the issue yeah. in a project. Um, so we're still working through this. We proposed our initial concept was to propose horizontal deflections instead of vertical. So to install actual raised medians. I'm sure you've seen the low lying stamped paved medians along East Avenue that kind of branch out. We want to put in actual curved medians in the roadway and then off of the bike lane on the west side uh, put in uh, like a chicane basically creating a horizontal s curve deflection for motorists which is proven to have a impact to decrease speeds anywhere from three to six miles an hour which is kind of what we're trying to get to the 85th percentile speed along east avenue i think it's 31 and we're trying to get it to 25. and so that combined with the crossing at Cabildo court uh, which currently has an RFB recently installed. Do you use that to access campus? I do. Yeah, yeah. that was my next question. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What's the plan for that? Because I've almost gotten hit there a few times. So we are going to consider raising that crossing. Really? Uh, because the the medical center gave their input and they said, okay, if there's one, you know, not, again, they are stakeholder input, so we take their input into account their input does not necessarily control the design but they were uh okay with the idea of one race crossing rather than a series of tables along the corridor mm -hmm. and so we would we are going to propose to uh raise that crossing so it would be come up to curb height so vehicles would be forced to slow down in advance of it to traverse it and then continue on their route um related to that the <clears throat> crc we have a project contract with vtrans we're actually studying their rfps there. That one in front of your house is being filmed by the TRC. Oh, for compliance? For they're being, um, it's a before after study. So we've actually filmed those locations before the RFPs went in, and now there'll be the summer follow up and um, recording, you know, looking at how motorists approach them, if they slow down, look around, or, you know, do they yield? Do you always get in? Right. <laughs> That's good. Right now. 
Hmm? It's recording right now. Uh, they're done. Uh, the cameras are moved around the state because it's statewide, and you know they left out there. Yeah, the, one of the other grad students in the TRC is in charge of shuffling them around all over. <laughs> I don't know the schedule. Fun gig. Yeah. 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 <laughs> don't go to 33. Don't go to 33. Don't go to 33. They didn't want to be liable for knowing about. I, yeah, yeah, so well this is this is an interesting project though where you are balancing needs so this project is actually kind of sort of in limbo because the median and chicanes that we're uh, proposing would deflect into the on-street parking and so we need to potentially remove some of that parking yeah, my landlord <laughs> went to the last outreach meeting for oh really to argue for us keeping the park. yeah <laughs> there you go so it's sensitive any topic involving i mean we're dealing with this on main street right now parking 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 People, uh, yeah, well, I'll say my opinions. But <laughs> um, it's a lot easier when you get a project that doesn't impact parking because it's much more likely to be implemented. So I thought I'd take a deep dive. I realize I'm already over what I was hoping for a total here of 20 minutes so I could we can engage in a bit of discussion. So I'll, I'll zip through this and then maybe we'll come back and chat through some of the stuff. But again, very informal. If you got any questions, toss up a hand or interrupt me and we'll talk through them. But North Champlain Street, Manhattan Drive, uh, bike facilities. This is a really exciting project. Eric and I actually worked on the concept plan for this in 2018. Uh, and the project, 17. Uh, well, we presented in November of 2018. Because oh, okay. I have that on the next slide. Um, <laughs> that's the only reason I know that. Uh, it will represent many firsts for the city. So they want to consider a two way separated bike lane uh, along North Champlain Street and then more general bicycle bicycle infrastructure improvements to Manhattan Drive, given how constrained that corridor is. But uh, as we're proposing it, it would not only be the first two way separated bike lane in the entire city, it would also have the first the city's first uh, bicycle signal faces, um, which would be great. And I say like other efforts start to finish with this one for us as well. So yeah, a little background on the project. Uh, Walk bike plan D, plan BTVs, the city's master plan for walking and biking infrastructure. Um, as I hit on uh, we presented on it in 2018 and then the project kind of got pushed aside, but then it brought back. Uh, it was brought back and it evolved to include uh, elements of improvement to Manhattan Drive, given there is an art center and a school along Manhattan Drive that um, people generally walk and bike to. So the city wanted to provide infrastructure for those users. What is a separated bike lane? I realize the answer is on the screen. Does anybody actually know? Without looking at the screen, which you're all looking at. <laughs> so I don't trust any of you. Um, now, so a separated bike lane, I'm sure you guys know what a standard striped bike lane is, is literally a six inch wide white stripe on the road with a symbol that looks like a bicycle. And that says this is for bikes. Uh, it turns out those are great, but they also create a lot of issues. People treat them as parking lanes. People don't really care about pulling in, into a bike lane. So if you separate them, people will stop doing that. If you put a concrete curb for them to run over, they will stop doing that. Um, if you make it illegal to queue or stop in a separated bike lane, people will hopefully stop doing that if you regulate them better. But the key difference between a standard bike lane and a separated bike lane is a, the presence of a vertical element. A, I prefer to use separated rather than protected. Protected bike lanes, also another uh, popular term. I am not going to be protected by a two inch wide plastic post. So I think it's kind of a misnomer, but you are still separated from traffic vertically with that. Um, thinking through general bike school facility design principles, what are you considering when you're looking at putting a separated bike lane on the road? First and foremost, how much space do you have? Can you actually accommodate, can you actually accommodate that facility? If you can, what are your forms of separation going to be? This was a huge debate on the city of Burlington's because they've used these flexible delineators on the left side in previous projects. I think North Union Street used to have some. Uh, those got sheared off quicker than uh, somebody who was away from the barbershop for too long. Uh, those got cut. They said we absolutely do not want to include flexible delineators if we can avoid it. Um, we still said, though, however, it snows in Burlington. Plow drivers need to operate in Burlington. Plow driver hits one of these, which is mounted to the pavement with four 18-inch long steel dowels. You're going to be buying a new plow. We don't want you to do that. So we did propose flex posts in very strategic locations to not so much uh, to include as few of them as possible, to, but to still identify the presence of a lower lying object that could easily get snowed, snowed on uh, in the winter months. What does the mid block look like? 
North Champlain Street, there's a lot of driveways. What are we doing to what are we doing to potentially mitigate conflict potential at those? And what are we doing at the intersections? And that was arguably the more the most interesting topic, at least for me, uh, in designing North Champlain Street. One of the challenges we have two standards, quote unquote, standards are regulatory standards are law to follow for separated bike lane design. Separated bike lanes came about in 20, 2013, 2014. The regulatory standards that we have are dated 2009 and 2012. So we are truly relying on best practices when we're laying these facilities out. And so in 2015, the Federal Highway Administration and a couple state DOTs recognized this need. These facilities are growing in popularity, but a lot of people don't know how they work. What's the best way to put them on the ground? Uh, what are good practices? What are best practices? What is the research of implemented projects in bike heavy cities told us about building these elsewhere? And so there were two, two guides both published in 2015 by MassDOT and FHWA. I look at both of these documents almost every day for guidance in the work I do. They have been critical and they have kind of in a way become, I'll put it in quotes, standard uh, because they are so full of best practices that have kind of morphed, evolved and adapted through time. And these are what we rely on when, we, when we're looking at designing a lot of these facilities. Pulling that all back to North Champlain Street, this is from our 2018 presentation, that little typical section right there. Um, what are we considering on North Champlain Street? Two-way bike travel, safety, first and foremost, Parking be damned, these projects are about safety. Uh, users are being exposed, users are being hit, users don't have ways to adequately, adequately and safely use alternative modes of transportation, therefore we need cars, therefore we do need on-street parking. That is why it is the almighty, it is considered the only mode. If we bolster our city's infrastructure with alternative modes of transportation, promoting active transportation, people will be less reliable on on-street parking spaces, on their personal automobile. That's where we wanna get to, that's the, that's the dream. But how do we make it work? How do we make it intuitive? How do we provide access to these facilities? How do we make sure we're mitigating any conflict potential uh, of these facilities, particularly on North Champlain Street? We have intersections of Pearl Street, North Street, and Manhattan Drive, a couple side street intersections along the way too, a little bit lower volume. What about driveways? People pulling in and backing out of their driveways. We need to make sure they can still get into their driveways. We need to make sure they have the safe sight lines to back out of their driveways as they'll be coming through a separated bike facility and not strike motorists, uh, uh, bicyclists, excuse me. What about traffic? There's currently two lanes along North Champlain Street. We're reducing it to one. Does the traffic still work or are we just creating gridlock, which is its own form of anti-sustainability? Uh, what are the precedents? What are we looking to? Understanding our standards are outdated. What do we know works elsewhere? How can we apply? that here these are kind of all of the questions that we uh that we think about alternatives we know we want a two-way does that make sense we looked at one-way pairs going northbound on north champlain street and southbound on park street people weren't were a little wary of that because they they weren't sure if people would still use it in that way or if they would just ride the opposite direction on the street that they didn't want to be on known as salmonic so all the things that we consider emergency services oh my god Burlington fire department do great work. You also kept me up at night. Uh, the fire department claims they need 20 feet of clear space on a roadway to operate, to extend their stabilizers. That really will kill just about any separated bike project that you can think of. So you need to make sure that it, what we are proposing in a buffer is actually traversable. That space then counts as a width that is acceptable for the fire department. That was a big, that was a big Big problem maintenance we need to make sure we can plow these things we need to make sure people can use them year round we we're very fortunately just south of a winter city uh, known as montreal which has incredible bike infrastructure that people use all year round city of burlington has traveled north a few times to see what are their best practices for maintenance what equipment do they have can we afford that equipment can we keep these things cleared in the winter all things we as the consulting engineers need to be thinking about for the client when they communicate their needs to us Zooming in, zooming in on the intersections, I mentioned uh, three key ones. I'm going to focus on North Street and Manhattan Drive. North Street, I'm sure you can think of, is a just a, a four-way intersection with three directions of travels, travel, knowing North Champlain is one way northbound. We need to look at how many vehicles are turning off of North Champlain. What are those vehicles? How are those vehicles conflicting with our two-way bike movement? Is it gonna, are they gonna be aware that there's actually now two-way travel? There's gonna be a bike heading southbound that they need to be mindful of turning left, as well as a bike lane coming northbound that they need to be mindful of when they're turning left. How does that work? Do we need to evaluate phase separation? So using the signal to separate the bike movement from the vehicular movement to totally mitigate that conflict, or can we keep the intersection 
running in a way where those movements are concurrent, but we sign and warn of them so that there's still safe passage for bicyclists and motorists. What about the pet exclusive phases? Burlington likes um, pet exclusive phases. Barn stance, they, you, you active, actuate a pedestrian button and it's just pedestrian movements during an all red for vehicles. Does that, is that necessary at that intersection or was it just put in because it was consistent practice elsewhere in the city? These are all things that we looked at. Um, revising operations, do we need to do that? What we ended up doing is we evaluated turning thresholds at North Champlain Street. We saw that the left turning volume was low enough. It didn't meet or exceed the thresholds identified in the guidance documents I pointed out earlier. And so what we landed on here and what it looks like in an engineering drawing is this. You follow it? Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, who said oh yeah? Yeah, okay, tell us what's happening now. Uh, so what does this look like? This is, uh, this is the uh, when the idea becomes the reality and you hand the reality to a contractor, they need to be able to build everything you're telling them to build. They also need to be able to build everything you are telling them to build. <laughs> that is why a contractor is gonna want every single line item and every single quantity shown to them so they know how to bid on a project. That is why engineering drawings can look like this. Um, this looks much more complex. I always say, man, when this gets done on the ground, it's gonna be about eight new signs and a, some linear feet of new striping. And how much time did I spend on this? I don't wanna know. But uh, what we basically, how we basically utilize this intersection is understanding that from this single lane, there's not gonna be enough conflict potential to warrant Phase separation, you know, being cognizant. Phase separation means new signal infrastructure. New, new signal infrastructure means tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Potentially a reconstruction of the intersection, reconstruction of utilities. How do we make it work with the budget that the client has told us they have for construction, all the while making sure the project we're implementing will actually function and work with the users, with motorists, with bikers, with walkers, everything. And so what we ended up doing and considering here at this location was the implementation of uh, turning vehicle yield signs, as well as bikes using the pedestrian signal. So anytime that signal goes, that will basically be the signal that they follow for that southbound bike, especially because they don't have a signal face pointing this way because it's one way travel. So these bikers need to know that when they get to this intersection, they will be looking at the pedestrian signal. We also did away with the pedestrian exclusive and kept it just for the east west movement because it still it still worked there and operated well enough but we realized we could run these uh, concurrent bicycle movements with the northbound throughs, which was the heaviest movement, as well as the northbound lefts, and obviously we're free of conflict with the northbound rights. That may seem, oh my God, you're running bicycles through the intersection at the same time as motorists. It happens everywhere in the city right now. When it's two-way and coming in the opposite direction, with any new project, as I identified with any first project for an agency or a city, there's gonna be a bit of a learning curve. We recommended getting out education about two-way bike facilities to, to the community members. DPW having an education campaign, looking at how can we actually make people aware that this change is coming. Do we do changeable message signs that are out there before construction begins on the project? Do we put flyers on neighbors' mailboxes? Understanding this is a primarily a commuter route with it trying to get to 127 to head to the new north end. How do we reach the most people about what these changes are gonna be? Those aren't necessarily things that we help the city with. Those are things that they do, but all recommendations we've made because we can put forth an engineering drawing and study and design a project through best practices, but understand that when it's the first of its kind in the city, the city needs to be, be mindful of that when they go to implement it. Heading north, very different story man and drive. Uh, this is, a as I said, a commuter route. You turn left at the end of North Champlain Street and you get onto the Beltway, which takes you up into the New North End. Crazy vehicle volumes at this location. We had 500 northbound left turns making that movement, as well as 700, and these are peak hour counts, excuse me, as well as 700 vehicles coming from the east to get onto, to get onto the uh, Beltway. How do we make that work with bikes? We can't just have bikes exiting North Champlain Street down to Manhattan Drive free of, free of, uh, consideration as they enter an intersection with 1200 potential conflicting movements. So what do we need? We needed separate phasing. Uh, how did we make that work? Where, where do we put the bikes was our first question because uh, you can't really tell here, but this is a very constrained environment. You have the guardrail here, you have a massive slope and you have very narrow roadway with the long Manhattan drive. So how do we do that? We needed to come up with another first for the city and uh, get those bicyclists out of the roadway so they are free of that conflict 
up onto their own exclusive jug handle. Picture uh, the intersection of East Terrace and Main Street, or East uh, Main Street and Spear Street. Um, that is a jug handle. Now we're creating a movement for bikes. I also think this is pretty cool. <laughs> I got to lay this out. This is a fun. I'll zoom in on that intersection because uh, what we also needed to do was make sure bikes got through the next the next intersection safely as well, understanding that all of the 500 turns off of this street and 700 vehicles coming through, 90% of those vehicles are turning north onto the beltway. So we evaluated alternatives here. This was the selected alternative. It was not my favorite, but we think that giving bicyclists nine feet of space with buffer on both sides for motor vehicles uh, should hopefully be sufficient. Anytime you have a bike in between two vehicular lanes is not desirable, but working within the constraints of the project, this was the city, this was the city's preferred alternative. This is what we've designed for. Looking at this signal, how did we how did we actually make this happen up here? We are going to completely redesign and reconstruct the signal as well as do do some additional uh, hardscape work to the intersection to get these bicyclists out of Manhattan Drive and to provide them access to the new two way facility. So I said, how do we get people into and out of it? We're going to create a ramp up to the sidewalk and then create a bicyclist jug handle. So a bicyclist will tra travel up this ramp through the sidewalk. Hopefully they'll be going slowly enough, which they'll need to to make that movement anyway avoid conflicts with pedestrians, then cue right here. When they're right here, a video camera will detect them, and when their turn comes, will activate a bicycle exclusive phase that the bicyclist will then travel totally free of any vehicular conflict southbound into the two-way bike facility. Same thing in the northbound direction. If you're a bike and you cue here, that same camera mounted on this signal pole right here will detect you. Once the vehicular phase is done, all the vehicular traffic signals will go red, You'll get a green light to either turn right, again, across these 500 vehicles, that conflict is now mitigated, so you turn right. Or if you're heading west, similarly, these vehicles are stopped, these 700 vehicles are stopped, you will be able to slowly and surely stroll into this lane, also hopefully giving you enough space to get out through this mixing zone up here and into that, into that pocket lane up here where you now have buffers from all of the motor vehicle traffic. So that's the idea there. That I think is my last slide. I like to leave people with this. US DOT, the governing Department of Transportation for our country policy, incorporates safe and convenient walking and bicycle facilities into transportation projects. Every agency has a responsibility to improve conditions for people walking and biking. Integrate these facilities into your transportation systems. This is Pennsylvania Avenue. This is America's Main Street. Can you see the sidewalks? <laughs> I always get a kick out of this project. Uh, this is one I worked on in DC. We're totally streetscaping Pennsylvania Avenue, so there'll be separated bike lanes out of the roadway, raised up to sidewalk grade for six blocks west of the White House. But as it currently stands, there are seven lanes of travel for cars, parking lanes on both sides, and 10 foot sidewalks within a 120 foot right away. So I just like to leave people with that thought. And we'll open it up for discussion. My contact is there. That's all I got. Way over time. I apologize. <laughs> <Don't>. <laughs> yeah. Is this the first cyclist drug handle? In the city? Anywhere. I've never seen one before. They're not common. They are uh, growing in popularity because of that need to get yeah. a left turner out of the way of motor vehicle travel and not to have them cross multiple lanes of traffic to make a left turn. It's going to become, I think, a more implemented and popular approach to cyclists cyclist movements making left turns. Can you name any examples of them? So maybe I should pull one up later. Oh, man. Not off the cuff. Okay. Have you heard of a two-stage turn box? It's basically yeah. a striped version of a jung handle where you are, oh man, I could, I could show a million examples of those, but it's basically a painted version of the jug handle movement, whereas if you're traveling, if you're traveling in a bicycle lane, let's say you have two motor vehicle lanes to your left and you're in this bike lane within the intersection because you want to turn left here rather than braving crossing those two if there's enough space within the intersection and free of conflict they'll stripe a box which will have a bicycle symbol and a left turn arrow and you'll cue in that box until the other direction of travel gets a green signal and then you will
will then use that from that space in advance of the parked cars, which are back here opposite a crosswalk, to then get into your facility free of conflict. The idea is kind of the same with a jug handle. It's just, is there space for that in the roadway? If yes, great. They'll probably stripe a location for it. If not, they'll consider that jug handle application. Cool. Yeah. Any other questions? How did you pick the spot for the bike boulevard? Like, is it is the intention to take bicycle traffic off of like the surrounding streets that might not be as like conducive to bicycle traffic? But, like, how did you kind of like know that there was a need in like that specific area and that it would actually like get the volume that you intend? That unfortunately is not uh, an area that we have the say in. That was determined in the, yes the walk bike plan. So identified in the walk bike master plan. Master plans are, are built from uh, many different directions, many different stakeholders, but primarily uh, public public input and community engagement. Where do you want to ride? Where do you need bike facilities? And from that, the city created for the entire for the entire city within the boundaries of the whole city, a bicycle master plan. And so North Champlain Street was identified in that bicycle master plan as a priority bicycle route. I would venture to say it's because it's one of the few continuous north-south streets. It was also identified that at two travel lanes, it was probably over uh, well under motor vehicle capacity for that. So it could be a relatively easy project, given all you were doing is removing a travel lane that didn't need to be there. Let's say, given how residential North Champlain Street is, let's say that lane was a parking lane, might be a totally different story. Probably not doing the project there. But because you're not impacting something that people will truly, I don't want to say care about, but because you're basically not making motor vehicle travel any worse, that was identified as an acceptable route for a bike facility. I think looking at other north-south routes, it's, uh, I think I actually have the map. A lot of them are not continuous. North Champlain Street is, I think to my knowledge, one of the very few roadways that travel all the way north. Uh, I think you have North Union, which goes that way as well, but it gets into interesting intersections, I believe, here with uh, North Muskie and then up with uh, say Spring Street. So this was one of the one of the few continuous north-south routes. And again, it just presented that opportunity. I think it was identified as a desirable route because if you go right, you can also get to the Intervale Trails and the shared use path over there as well. And that was another another motivation to add that Manhattan Drive. So I know I didn't speak too too heavily about Manhattan Drive, but on uh, east of this intersection, we're adding bike lanes that'll continue all the way to Spring Street, and that's where that school is located that we want to get people to, but obviously everybody will be able to use those bike lanes. So yeah, I'd love to be more part of that planning phase because I would, I would I agree with the use of North Champlain Street? I don't know. It's a challenging street. Those are two very confusing intersections. It's also a very high volume intersection like we saw. There's also a lot of driveways on North Champlain Street that are not going to be expecting a southbound bicyclist. The thing is, once that's in, hopefully that expectation is there, that expectation has grown, you see that infrastructure, you know to look for it. Yeah. Off the top of your head, do you know an estimate of um, the change in travel times that that lane reduction is going to see for those roads? Uh, it was almost negligible. Really? Yeah. Okay, that's cool. It was, I think, a few seconds at the Manhattan Drive intersection because we're carving out that time for that bicycle exclusive phase, but because it's an actuated phase and it's not on recall, so that phase will only run when a bicyclist is detected. Mm -hmm. If you think about that X number of uh, actuations within the peak hour period, you're looking at almost a negligible vehicular delay. Mm -hmm. Do you know how much that project costs? Or do you have- Construction? Yeah. I think, I think it's, uh, Four hundred forty thousand dollars, and that's primarily driven by the barrier device we're using. Um, so that was a big, a big question. I, I don't have a specific detail, but we're basically going to be implementing uh, these types of barriers. These are eight foot long precast concrete barriers that are doweled into the pavement in four different locations. The city didn't want to do any permanent uh, curbing. They didn't want to rip up the pavement and cast in place. I think they wanted to to have things be a little bit flexible, a little bit modular if they did want to move things around. Um, so this, uh, you know, it depends where you go, but some agencies will consider precast curb elements more of a permanent infrastructure. Whereas if you were to just do um, 
flex post. These things are 75 bucks a piece installed. So it's next to next to nothing if you if you need to well not next to nothing but a much lower cost than something like this which is about four hundred and fifty dollars to precast and install, um, but it still gives them that that ability to be flexible, uh, which I think with any new project there's a little bit of you know fear of things not going well being able to remove it if you, you know we obviously don't want it to be removed we want it to become we want people to adapt and it to become a part of the city's infrastructure but. Yeah, almost a half a million dollars, and that's a lot of that's driven by the signal changes too, which about twenty percent of the project cost. Yeah. Are there any implementations for snow removal of the bike lanes? Yeah, that, so that was actually one of our design considerations. Um, we needed to make it wide enough for the city to use their plows. Oh, okay. um, so you can see it right here. We needed twelve feet, and very fortunately, we had twelve feet. So yeah, this will be. This would be actually one of the wider bike facilities I think I've ever laid out at just over 16 feet of total width of 12 feet for two way bike travel and then a four foot buffer. And that was actually kind of the fire department thing. We got them to agree to 14 feet of clear space before the concrete barrier, but then understanding if and when they need to, they could straddle the concrete barrier if they truly needed to. But it was never necessarily about response time and more about being able to um, Put out their uh, stabilizers if they needed to respond to a high elevation fire with a ladder truck. Yeah, that's great. Um, so they got rid of the scramble, but um, are they at least doing a leaving head pace so the bikes can get out in front? It seems like that's what they've been switching to in a lot of places, like six seconds. LPIs, yeah. I need to actually remember looking that up in the plans just before I came in. I cannot recall. Yeah, I need to check. I, mean, I remember <laughs> analyzing that. Check, check the plans, I, yeah. I think every intersection in Burlington has an LPI. Yeah. yeah. So I would be shocked if that's not part of our plans. Yeah. Yeah, yeah then they can at least have, a, have a way to get, out. exactly. Yeah. Yep, in advance of the vehicles before that conflict presents itself. Uh, so this is, I think, interesting. I'm sure, I think I read this in the city, but in Burlington, they allow bicyclists to use the LPI at their intersection. So in other places, that's illegal. Um, yeah, they actually just changed their municipal regulations because of College and South Prospect. We put in a bike lane up College Street for, I think, that one block. And we, because they didn't want to put in a bike uh, signal, they wanted bicyclists to be able to use a pedestrian signal, but that was not allowable in their municipal regulations. So they actually revised their MRs to allow bicyclists to use pedestrian signal lights. We, in the senior design project, we, I had the students look at College Avenue for bike boulevard type thing. Oh, yeah. uh, somebody worked on that. Did Julia Clark work on that? Yeah. Yeah. She interned for us last year with Amanda. I just saw Amanda snuck out. But. Um, but they didn't get quite as far as I had hoped. The, the city was a little, um, but that, that intersection came up though. And, and South Prospect. It's just like a, a, it seemed to me an obvious location for a bicycle um, signal. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, a T intersection where bikes can keep going mm -hmm. is pretty much what they're used for in most mm -hmm. places. Yeah. Um, and I don't, I don't, it was unclear. Um, they never really got, the city never really explained why that wasn't an option for them. I don't know if it was just cost or what. I have some ideas, but yeah. as they're my client, I'll just go off the record. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I, I used to, I went to college in Davis, California. Oh, and so the Mecca. My, my community school went through, you know, every day at campus, two of these bicycle um, signal phased intersections that were teased into. Bike stuff that continued. We didn't have any jug. <laughs> Probably some, also done interesting. Some roundabouts, some bike roundabouts. And my wife went to Davis too. So I went out there for the first time in like 2018. Got to, got to see it all. More bikes than cars. More bikes than people. Almost didn't leave. <laughs> did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Did you have to use any of the right away when you were um, redesigning this? We did not. No, and that was actually a, a big thing because you know in our when we were originally scoping the contract for the project, we said. You know, for all intents and purposes, a two way cycle track on one side of the road kind of becomes like a side path. What do we want to build this up like a side path, put it, curb it, put it on the sidewalk, and that might get more into those right away impacts. So this is your this is your right away line, which yeah. 
90 percent of the time you can assume railway lines on the back of a sidewalk yeah. uh, but because that brought in a massive massive uh caught increase in cost and potential for right-of-way acquisition that was not considered okay. yeah a lot of agencies you'll see their first choice is always going to be can we make it work in a retrofit capacity because that's going to be the lowest cost the highest likelihood of implementation and the lowest impact on right-of-way yeah you mentioned that there are some cyclist specific signage being implemented in these projects could you give us an example of those cyclist specific signage and um um pedestrian not pedestrian signals but cyclist signals yeah so that and i don't have i i did a too zoomed in too zoomed in of a cutout here but this is a snippet on an otherwise total signal plan so a bicycle signal looks exactly like a normal traffic signal except instead of a red green yellow ball it is a the bicycle symbol mm -hmm. in the signal face which matches uh like these signs so you can see that's that's the bike symbol i apologize for the graininess but that will be the green symbol when that lights up it will be that bike outline that everybody knows and recognizes um you can also see we did some regulatory signs so like when uh we say left turns veer right use this ramp and also yield to the pedestrians pedestrians have the right of way in the crosswalk yeah. and bicyclists are vehicles technically so when you come up on the when you come up out of your bike lane uh and what you want to do for these left turns just be mindful of yielding to pedestrians so that's a regulatory sign applying to bicyclists uh to request green white on the symbol so there's that little detector symbol up there we also needed to warn motorists about uh the presence of two-way bike travel so not an MUTCD compliant sign but one the city wanted to see we have warning signs that have bicycles with a double arrow mounted on the top of one-way signs so while one way establishes the direction of travel we're now alerting motorists to be mindful of two-way bike travel for example you're not if you're coming through this intersection you're not going to be going through it at the same time as north south bikes but we just want you to be mindful of their presence and that's why we have the high visibility markings through the intersection just like a crosswalk these are the uh red infill crosswalks with white transverse markings otherwise in the city you'll probably see some ladder like exact a ladder crosswalk mm -hmm. and so we did a similar pattern for the bike for the bike movement but it'll be fluorescent green on the pavement yeah this was a big one i hope it gets built it's supposed to get built this year so we'll see burst cliff parkway uh one of the earlier projects i mentioned that's supposed to get built uh in april and may and uh this is to be built this this construction season so look out for it and then so there's improvements along manhattan drive if you go to the west that's going to make it i imagine like to get off of north avenue and cut through this way because that's right where for those not from the north end is where the bike lanes abandon you in north avenue and get squished with some parked cars <laughs> yeah it is kind of some in interesting geometry how manhattan just manhattan drive just kind of ends into like a sharp 90 degree turn um unfortunately because that is such a constrained right of way and i apologize i couldn't share the full plan i figured you guys didn't want to look at 27 sheets that looked like this <laughs> um you know we, we added in you can see the start of a buffered bike lane here that then continues we added in as much as we could but these exclusive facilities because the paved roadway narrows so quickly we unfortunately have to rely on shared lane markings and then bike route signage to at least amplify the presence of bikers and make it more appear more of a shared street and multi-use street but that was one of those uh, constrained environments. Fortunately, the traffic volume drops off dramatically after the intersection. I was going to say, well, you just, uh, the issue was always, you could get through Manhattan Drive where the Scout and Co coffee shop is going to go into that neighborhood there. And it's fine until you get to this. And then now, <laughs> hopefully, you will be able to get through this much better. There's a lot of pain. So you can see, actually, another thing we're doing here is this intersection, we're narrowing it uh, ever so slightly just to slow those right turns um into and off of route 127 understanding that we're now going to have more bicyclists in the area so in the next project one one of you guys become the mayor on the city council <laughs> and to get uh control of 127 from vtrans or whatever and put the bicycle path on the street yep and, um, that would be we'll work point. on it for you, Dr. Rungo. We'll make your commute to work fully I'm a, bike proof. I'm imagining I go along the waterfront, but it's a missed opportunity. You have the intervale, the trails, the Homestead, 
it's a barrier. There's no real traffic volume on it, considering the yeah. like an interstate. But what a missed opportunity to have parking along it. You could get off and fish in the pond or skate. Yeah. You can go into the intervale. If it's 25 miles an hour instead of 50, you know, folks from Colchester will have a, an extra 30 seconds on the yep. commute. Um, and then you could have bicycling, right? You just keep on going. Exactly. Yeah, and the bike path, that's been another significant project of ours. We've done the redesign. I believe the bike path is now 100% open uh, all the way from Queen City Park Road to uh, North Ave as it crosses. That has been an effort eight years in the making, I think, the bike path. Considering the bike path, there's one spot, spot that's not done. I don't know if it ever will be, but like North Beach. The bridge? Yeah. <laughs> it's apart. We're waiting for the RFP. As soon as that RFP comes out, I think we've already written a proposal for it because we thought it was going to come out like five years ago. And I imagine that was put off because if you touch that, the culvert, the whole oh, yeah. tunnel. You're, you're ripping the whole thing out. You're dropping the grade of the road, too, for emergency access to create the vertical clearance. Oh, yeah. I, I seriously think we like pre-wrote a proposal knowing that was coming out and then it just never came out. Uh, but hopefully one day, yeah, because the, the like super wide, like aggregate shoulders bike path just ends and then it's like well, eight feet of janky paper. It's crazy. You know, I drive a cargo bike with some kids on the back and then it's the squeeze through there. Yeah. Now that the sides have crumbled off to the asphalt. Part, <laughs> it's, like... it's tough. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. You said that when you were doing the um, did you imagine yourself doing transportation? You want to talk about how you got into the field? Yeah, I uh, I I actually never really thought of uh, transportation as part of civil engineering, which sounds bizarre given it is what I eat, sleep, and breathe now. But I took a uh, guy. I mean, I don't even know what the course was, but it was uh, with Brian Lee. Do you remember? Did you work with Brian at all? No, I I just started here about three years ago. Oh, okay. I Bri was his last class when I was a sophomore. What year was that? 2014. Okay, yeah. So he's been out there. So I took a class with Brian Lee, which was like Introduction to Traffic Engineering or whatever, whatever it was. I right? learned about level of service for the first time, and he got a class in basically active transportation planning and design, and it was something I had never really thought about as being relevant. Um, and then when I graduated in 2011 we were just kind of coming out of the recession of 08 and 09 and so a couple job opportunities were presenting themselves but i didn't uh i didn't see any openings that interested me i worked for a firm in stowe doing work that was totally unrelated to what i graduated in for a year and then a, a former uh, classmate of mine who also graduated in 2011 was working for bhp and she said hey there's an opening it's in structural engineering uh if you want to just take a stab at applying for it because that's where our need is and uh, I always knew, OK, if I just get in the door here, I can maybe morph this into the actual career I want. And sure enough, I started the VHB. I worked for eight months as a structural engineer, and then we won the Burlington Bike Path Project. And I walked into my director's office and I said, let me screw this up. <laughs> uh, and since then, I've been designing bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. Cool. Yeah, it just it, it kind of like opened my eyes. And then when I moved to DC, I didn't have a car. I relied on my bike to get around. I relied on transit. I relied on walking a uh, very walkable bikeable city in dc i mean every city is a little bit different also incredible transit system but i'd love to you know and my whole idea was when i came back i'd kind of bring those bring what i learned there back here and it's been really thrilling to get to do that with projects like north and blaine street and now with uh, great streets main street as well so yeah it's been fun definitely do what you want do what you care about otherwise you're gonna be miserable <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, well, thank you so much. Absolutely, my really pleasure. excited to hear from you. This is awesome. Yeah, are you guys mostly juniors, seniors? Juniors. Juniors, yeah. Well, as Amanda said, if anybody's looking for intern with an interesting firm and you can see as much or as little of me as you want, <laughs> talk to Erica. She's very loud. She's got gotcha. <laughs> You'll hear him no matter where I am very, I'm very passionate. Been told that very passionate about what I do, almost to a fault. No, it is. It is. No, it's, I yeah. It's my yeah. Um, are the internships on the VHB website? Or they are. They, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So yeah, reach out. Um. We're we're definitely busy right now. We're only anticipating getting more busy. I mean, you guys are 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 all of you in transportation, or is that your focus, or is this just kind of an interest through ITE? Well, we started with. The
Dr. Rowan's class of transportation systems, and we saw a presentation about ITE. And oh, cool. up until then, we hadn't really known that transportation engineering was really a thing. This sounds so, very similar to what I just So we just kind of decided to start this to bring people in to hear about what people actually do. Yeah. And what we could actually be doing versus like math problems about wastewater or yeah. stuff like uh, that. So. This is just, I mean, <laughs> so. we our transport we have a transportation systems group and we have a transportation engineering group. A lot of the other work I do, I do a lot of scoping studies, feasibility studies, like on Colchester Avenue. The engineering design is just a part of what I do. We also have like a full roadway engineering team. That's who did a lot of the Burlington bike path design, permitting, I mean, transportation systems. We do a lot of traffic engineering studies, I, I call out here. Um, I think our best project right now, personally, is the Main Street project. I mean, getting to redesign the Main Street of the city you grew up in, I think it's pretty cool. Um, but we have we do so much in transportation. Uh, I think we're going to try and get somebody else in here in a month or two to talk about our Lamoille Valley Rail Trail project. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail. It's 93 miles between St. Johnsbury and Swanton, and we just wrapped up the final design of the remaining 44 miles of that. So you will be able to bike uh, between those two locations, or snowmobile in the winter, or walk if you wanted to walk it. Um, <laughs> wouldn't recommend that, but. Uh, that's another huge project we've been working on the Moyle Valley Rail Trail for the better part of 15 years, I think, at this point. I remember here, I'm from around there. So oh, yeah? Here, yeah, so at the end of this summer, you'll be able to bike or walk or snowmobile between Swan and St. Johnsbury on a continuous off-road path. So, like, for instance, my, my uh, contribution most recently to the latest project design was I designed all the intersections with state routes. So understanding that those are higher volume roadways, high speed roadways, I use a lot of my background in trail design and trail planning. I also, for better or worse, know a lot about signing and marking. Um, it's a blessing and a curse, but it's part of our roadway systems. It's necessary. See Erica nodding. Thank you. Um, and so I did focused a lot on how to make the crossings of those high speed, uh, higher volume roadways uh, safer when you're out in Hardwick and you see cars going 60 and you need to be able to safely cross the road make sure they see you and you see them. So I did all site assessments of all of those crossings, did site distance checks, site distance calculations, said what do we have for right of way, how are the slopes, can we reroute the path, to shorten the crossing and straighten it out, um, all things like that were my, contribut my contribution to that project, but that was, I think everybody in our office has worked on a project like that. When you work on a 93 mile on trail project, it tends to require a lot of different disciplines and we did all of that in house. Yeah, that's that. Well, that, if there are no other questions, I'll be on my merry way. Thank you all. Thanks for listening. Very engaged group. I appreciate that. And thank you, Evelyn, for thank you coordinating. For with my, I don't know where the money is. No, I, I, I'm working on the time. I'm working on it. I'm thank you for dealing with all of that. Returning no. okay. on Monday, so I was like, I need to make this week yeah, work. I, I hope it works. So I appreciate the urgency. Yeah.